All right, my friends, we have a very special video for you. The Marantz AV10 15.4 channel AV processor, the bench tests are in. I'm going to show you things about this product that no other YouTube channel is going to show you. I'm going to dive deep into these measurements so you guys know what you're getting for the money. Hey folks, I'm Gene Dallasalo with AudioHawks. As you know, I'm reviewing the Marantz AV10 and AM10 separates. I did an unboxing video. I am going to dive deep into the measurements of both of these devices and then do a formal review. But what I wanted to do today is I wanted to focus on the measurements of the AV10. I did an exhaustive test report on AudioHawks.com. And if you really want to get dive deep into the measurements and what they all mean, I suggest that you click on the link below. The article is there. But I want to explain the key uh, important things that I found in this product through my measurements. So I'm going to share my screen here with you. And then we will go over all of this great stuff. So like I said, this, pro this processor report is on audioholics.com right now. And I linked it up in the description below. So the first thing I wanted to do was um, use HDMI as a source. I want to check the multi-channel preamp outputs. I checked both balanced and unbalanced. I want to make sure you're getting good, clean signal drive so you could, you know, this could not be the source of distortion in your setup when you have multiple channels of amplification going externally. So in this case, the Marantz has a lot of output voltage. I like to see a processor have at least four volts RMS out of the balance, two volts RMS out of unbalanced, unclipped and clean. That'll pretty much drive most amplifiers to max power. These guys easily exceed that. We see 12 volts RMS unclipped, clean from the XLR outputs, six volt RMS from the unbalanced outputs. That's more than enough signal drive to drive any um, amplifier on the market. So here you can see I swept the uh, front, the uh, bed seven channels, and then the subwoofer. I put it on LFE plus both so I can activate the subwoofer. And you can see here is a 24 dB proactive slope on the sub. Now, the interesting thing is all of the channels track really well, except for the surround left. For some reason, there's about a tenth of a dB roll off at 20K, and all the channels roll off at the 3 dB points at 80K, which is the limit of my test gear with a 192 kilohertz sampling rate um, input. But the surround left channel has a slight more roll off. I think the 3 dB point was somewhere about 78 kilohertz. So that's way above audio range. You don't have to worry about anything like that. So this is more just an academic thing that I showed you that one of the channels is just slightly off, but it's not something that I'd worry about, not something that's audible. So I wanna show you how the output, uh, when I measured the XLR preamp outputs, you can see here, this is a measurement of uh, signal level versus distortion. And I plot it as a percentage of distortion, but you know, for you ASR uh, enthusiasts, I also put the sign ed on the right side on the vertical axis here. So you can see right above, you know, two, three volts, this is really, really clean. It's like 0.015% THD plus N. I think the sign ed's like 96 dB, the conversion for that, as you can see in the graph here. And it doesn't start clipping until you get to over 12 volts RMS. That's a good measurement. And of course, I did it for the RCA level. The distortion was about the same, whether it was XLR or RCA. It was pretty close um, because they use a phase splitter. Uh, so you're not getting a true differential output. So you're not getting all of the benefits of XLR. Of course, you are getting some more noise immunity with XLR. But you can see with the unbalanced, you get half the voltage, which is still more than enough. You're still getting a clean 6 volts RMS here. That's just awesome. Yeah, and you can see in this graph, I basically show you the balanced versus unbalanced outputs. The distortion uh, pretty much tracks really closely here. And just good, good performance here. Whether you use unbalanced or balanced, you're going to have plenty of drive. So I wanted to look at an FFT. Um, I look at the spectrum. I, I inject a one kilohertz tone and I look to see, first of all, is there any hum in the power supply, which you would see around 60 hertz? And what do the harmonic structures look like? So anytime you inject a tone, you are gonna get some harmonic distortion. 
And this is a very clean spectra. I think uh, in this case of the four volt RMS output, we're getting the third order harmonic is like 110 dB below the fundamental. That's really good. I consider anything over 90 to be good. And you can see here, uh, there's very, very little hum in the power supply. It's certainly below any kind of audibility, but that's really clean. And then I did the same thing for unbalanced just to check that. And I got pretty close results. I think the um, at two volts RMS, it was 101 dB down at the second order harmonic. And I did find um, very interesting when I go from changing the volume so the output is at two volts versus four volts, um, the odd order and even order harmonic balance shifts a little bit. It's not something that's audible. It's just something I noticed academically. But it's still, these are all really good measurements here. As I said here, whether you use balanced or unbalanced, the AV10 will provide very low distortion with more drive than you'll ever use to reach full power from any amplifier. So the next test, I want to see how quiet this is. And I ran a 0 dB FS input, which is max digital full scale on the input and 2 volts RMS on the output. And I got 112 dB, and that is really good. I mean, that's some of the best measurements I've seen out of a processor. Um, what this tells you is you're not going to hear any hissing. Even if you have like high sensitivity speakers and you're sitting relatively close to a surround speaker, you should not hear any hissing from this. I, I checked pure direct. I checked auto where it wasn't in pure direct, and it didn't really matter. The signal to noise ratio was among the best that I've seen in a processor. And then the last thing uh, on this section is the crosstalk. And what I do here is it's a very stringent test. I do um, all the channels driven and then one channel undriven. So that gives you the worst kind of crosstalk scenario. And you could see, um, I think it was about 80 dB of isolation from channel to channel at 20K. That's really good. I consider anything above 60 at 20K to be Pretty darn good for a good stereo separation. So I am very pleased to see the results here. You could see it like at one kilohertz, it's down 110 dB. I mean, that's just very well isolated. So next I wanted to look, I know there's a lot of analog people out there and I didn't want to forget about that. So in this test scenario, we're looking at an analog input, not an HDMI input, and we're looking at the multi-channel outputs. And you can see here, this is a very wide bandwidth preamplifier. It's certainly a straight line from 5 hertz to 80 kilohertz. It's, the bandwidth of this amplifier is beyond the bandwidth of my test gear. I'm going to guess maybe it's over 100 kilohertz. So it's very wide bandwidth amplifier. The FFT on this is very clean. Um, basically, what you were seeing before with the HDMI input, we're getting very similar clean distortion spectrum you know, no hum at 60 hertz. I even checked the DC offset. Um, I did a measurement and I, I guess I didn't put it here, but the DC offset was um, very low on this as well. So no worries about anything like that. Um, I wanted to look at the phono output for you vinyl lovers. I certainly love vinyl. And I used the, uh, the proper RIAA curve to linearize the response so we could see that uh, Marantz is correctly EQing their circuit to get a very linear response. It's flat to 20K with a slight rise above that. I don't think there's any concern there. And I wanted to look at the distortion versus uh, frequency response here. And you could see it again, stellar result. I mean, the THD plus N is 0.001% uh, across the whole bandwidth. I mean, this is just great. And I even checked the SNR out of the analog uh, phono outputs. It was 92 dB um, at two volts RMS. Like I said, anything above 90 is really quiet. And this is from the phono output. So this is a serious phono preamp. Like I said here, it's a serious phono preamp that anyone with a moving uh, magnet turntable and a good vinyl collection, you're going to love it. And uh, I actually might plug in my Marantz TT15S1 in this and check it out. So here is what separates the men from the boys in this processor. And I'm I'm very pleased with the two features that Marantz is now offering in this AV10, as well as some of their other products like the Denon, uh, the sister company, the Denon AH1. Um, there's two base management features here. It took me a little bit to test it, but I really wanted to go over this. But first, I want to show you just the basic base management that we would see from any processor. And 
the AV10 has textbook THX slopes. If you set the crossovers for 80 hertz, you get a second order high pass 12 dB per octave on your satellite speakers that are base managed, and you get a fourth order 24 dB per octave low pass for the sub. And I measured all this and it looks great. So now they have another feature, and this is something I did a video on this. This I was very excited that they're offering this LFE base routing. This is a request I had to Marantz and Denon for almost 15 years uh, because I run extremely large uh, tower speakers up front that are base capable that can play. The base that comes out of my speakers is commensurate with my powered subwoofers that are in the room as well. So I wanted to route LFE to my speakers and no Japanese product, uh, whether it's a receiver or a processor to date, allowed you to do that. If you ran a subwoofer channel, you wouldn't have LFE being rerouted to any of your speakers, even if you set them large. Traditionally, the only way you can get LFE to go to the main speakers in those kind of products was to turn the subwoofer channel off altogether. Well, Marantz and Denon now have this LFE base routing. So you could still route LFE to a dedicated sub, but now you could route the LFE to any channels on the bed that you set large. But I caution, as I said in my video, and I'll link it up here, I caution anybody that's doing this to make sure you have truly base capable speakers and use it sparingly, because I don't want anyone blowing out their speakers and then blaming me. <laughs> so here I just did some slopes here. Um, this is just confirming that when you're running your main speakers uh, full range and you're injecting an LFE signal to the subwoofer, you're also getting that matched um, to the main speakers as well. And you could adjust the slopes on this. This is based on the slope of the low pass filter crossover. I did a whole video on this. And then you could adjust the level. So if you want to knock it down 10 db or knock it down 20 db you can see that in the graphs here so i definitely recommend you uh being very careful with this feature it's awesome that they allow this and i'm just tickled that um, i'm going to be able to finally test something like this in my own setup because typically you only get this in very expensive processors from storm audio or trinog so it's very cool that uh this is the case here and you can see just the screenshot um you have to go into the distribution and the advanced menus and you go and you set your either you have it off, which is by default, or you set it for zero dB or minus 10. See in the surrounds, I have them turned off here. Very cool. And it works as advertised. The next thing that I want to show you is the base routing. So this was all on Marantz and Den, and they came up with this. They wanted to basically create base zones. And we are going to do a very technical presentation on the pros and cons of doing that. But what this feature does is if you have four subwoofers in your setup and you've put one in each corner, it'll assign those as base zones. So you'll have a left front, right front, rear back, and a rear left and rear right subwoofers. And the base from whatever speaker is base managed will go to the closest subwoofer. So in the case of the center channel, you're actually going to get the front two subwoofers going to that. And I show that in the measurements. In the case of a right surround speaker, then your back right subwoofer is going to be producing the base when you base manage that speaker, but not the front or not the other subs in common. So I want to show you... Um, this is where you set it all up. You have subwoofer mode, in this case would be directional versus mono. And then you could see the layout front left, front right, rear right, or rear left, rear right. And I confirm this here. So actually this was Shane Lee that inspired me to do this because I wasn't gonna put this in the test report, but he's got the A1H uh, Denon receiver and he wants to set up on his channel to show how the base zones work with listening tests. So I figured, why not devise a way to do this with the audio precision? And you could see here, um, he was wondering what happens with the center channel. And I answered that before. The center channel should get the base from the front, left, and right subs, which it does here. And I measured that. And it's at a reduced level because now you have basically two subwoofers playing a common base uh, from the center channel that's base managed. So they knock it down 4 dB. Of course, you could go and increase the master subwoofer level, but it's good that they're doing that so it doesn't overload 
your subwoofers with bass. So as I said before, when you look at a surround speaker, in this case, I'm looking at the surround um, back and the surround side on the left side. No, I'm sorry, the right side. And you could see that it corresponded with the subwoofer that I checked. So the right surround back and the right surround both send their subwoofers signal to the right rear sub and they do that at unity gain they don't they don't derate the the level because you're still using one sub for two speakers that it's summing base to and i show that in the measurement here so then finally i wanted to show you this mono split versus four subs and if you look at the graph up here at the top this is for um when you have one subwoofer so it's, it's a unity game with the speaker that's base managed. But when you run four subs mono split, it knocks the level down about 9 dB per, 9 dB per sub. And it actually, they were smart doing that because if, I, if you do the math and you add three correlated sources, in other words, three other subs to the one sub that you have, and they're all playing the same signal, then the net increase of SPL is going to be plus 9 dB. And they basically compensate for that with the level here. So that's pretty good foresight. I was very pleased with that. I also checked the subwoofer four, uh, and that's dedicated for a tactile transducer. So it gets LFE information. And the nice thing about this, um, in the past when they had this feature on the Denon AV AVR5805, the tactile transducer output only got LFE, but the other subs did not. They fixed that. So now all your subs are gonna get LFE even if you have the, that sub four dedicated for a tactile transducer. So I thought that was a really excellent touch that they did that. They definitely put a lot of thought into this whole, um, into this processor. I mean, from the good signal to noise ratio to the tons of output drive, to the fact that you have all these new base management features, this is a hard product to beat. I know the $7,000 price might sound a little bit steep, but there's nothing on the market that's giving you this advanced base routing, the advanced LFE um, redistribution to your main channels or whatever channels you set large. You have to go and you have to step up to something far more expensive like a Trinov or a Storm Audio. And that opens up a debate, well, what more do you get when you go to those processors? I'll do a separate video on that to answer that question. But the bottom line right now is this, this AV processor measures as good as I hoped it would. I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing so far. And what I'm gonna be doing next is doing the AMP 10, which is the 16 channel 200 watt by 16. I'm gonna be doing a bench test of that one. And then I'm gonna put these two pieces together and give you guys the rundown of how it sounds and also test it with Odyssey versus DRAC. That's the next plan as well. So we got a lot of coverage coming for the Marantz AV10 and AMP10. Guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up, hit the subscribe button. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep learning.